communication. Our gracious Father and our God, we thank thee for bringing us to this glad hour, so full of bright memories, so radiant with hope. Grant now that thy spirit shall speak to our waiting hearts, and may our hearts be so tremulous and responsive to all his breathings that this shall be for us an hour of new dedication as an hour of thanksgiving and of gratitude to thee. By thy spirit guide us so that we may render unto thee an acceptable service through Jesus Christ our Lord who also taught us when we pray to say Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say, say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewithal shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. <coughs> personality, great personality. There are different traits that have importance, but one of the most important traits of all is that of gratitude. The self-made man boasts, but in his boasting he forgets that he is not truthful, because the man who has had any measure of success must know that that measure of success has been made possible because of the help of other people. It's all wrong for this school at any time to forget that because we wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for loyal souls who helped and worked to make this possible. There are certain names that I wish this morning to again put on the scroll of memory that you have in your hearts and you will add to as you reach maturity and continue to add to through life. In the beginning, there was the choir, known Westminster Choir. 
There are some present here this morning who sang in that choir. It started in 1922. And the choir reached a certain point in its development when there were a hundred people who wished to engage members of the choir to go out into churches, Westminster Choir College was started. The choir started in 1922, and in 1926 the college started. And there comes the first name, that of Rhea B. Williamson, one of the co-founders of this college. She understood academic procedures. I knew a little about music and had abundance of conceit and self-confidence. She was the poised, calm one. So with her help, we started the college. We had an academic procedure that was right. When we moved later, went to New York State, we were accepted by the Board of Regents in New York State. That was because of Rhea B. Williamson. And when we came to Princeton, we were accepted and are still in the position now, tied for second place in the state. That is because of Rhea B. Williamson. In 1929, the choir college moved to Ithaca. It moved because in Dayton we could not give a degree. We had young people who were giving their lives, but they wanted something more than the training. So we moved to Ithaca, New York, for two reasons. First of all, we could finance the situation. And the second reason was that we could come under the Board of Regents, New York State, that had the highest standing in the United States. We stayed there three years because we quickly found it was not the place for us. We had God in our midst, and the state school doesn't want God in its midst and doesn't like to have God in its midst. God's a very embarrassing factor at times. So we decided that we must move from Ithaca. We were invited to go to Radio City, where I would have been in charge of all the the programs have our school in the top floor of Radio City. We're invited to be a part of Union Seminary, where our school would have been in Riverside Church. We're invited to go to Chicago, where we'd been part of the Chicago Seminary, Lake Forest College, and the Presbyterian Training School. But we came to see Dr. Erdman on a Saturday, and he said, come back on a Wednesday. We came back on a Wednesday, and things were all set up for us to meet the president, of the university, President Hibben and the trustees, to meet the president of the seminary, President Stevenson and the trustees, to meet the pastors of the churches, and to meet the trustees in the session of the First Presbyterian Church. And Wednesday morning, we started, by Wednesday afternoon, it was all closed. We even had our charter, because Dr. Erdman has to meet with the governor of the state. Just that simple and just that easy. We came to Princeton in 1932. In 1935, we lost Mrs. Talbot. You will see on this side in the chapel a picture. Please, all of you who are new, look at that picture, Mrs. Catherine Talbot. She started supporting the choir in 1924. In 1935, we opened school. We read a telegram from Mrs. Talbot saying that physical presence was not necessary because her spirit would be with us. Her spirit had passed on the night before, or rather she had passed on the night before, but the spirit was with us then, has been with us ever since. She supported and financed the choir, our first trip to Europe and our second trip to Europe. Uh, more than her money, though, was her heart, her love, and her affection for Rhea and for the speaker, and for the college. And in 1932, when we came to Princeton, we must mention the name of Dr. Charles R. Erdman. Dr. Erdman is known as the best loved man in the Presbyterian Church. He is known as a man who held the church together because of when they were in grave difficulty, they made him moderator, and he, with his Christian kindliness and Christian understanding healed the split, brought the church together. I can't tell you what that has meant to have Dr. Erdman with us through these years. He's the youngest person in this room. I was with him the other day, and he started off, and I had to change gear to keep up with him. Because, you see, I'm an old man. I'm 70. But he's a young man. 
he's 91. And as we get past a certain age, we start getting older. When you hear him preach this year, you will be very, very much ashamed of yourself because of the fact that he will be younger at all times than you are. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is his love, his affection, his understanding, his scholarship has all been brought to bear in this school, and we shall ever owe an eternal debt of gratitude to Dr. Charles R. Ehrman. And in 1933 and in 36 comes the name of Mrs. J. Livingston Taylor. She brought about one of the miracles that we have in this college. We were sitting at dinner in the Princeton Seminary Gymna or the University Gymnasium, alumni meeting of the university. President Dodds, who retired that last year, was giving his, his first address. They wouldn't let him speak because they wanted the choir to sing more. So Dr. Stevens said, gentlemen, if you'll keep quiet, the choir will sing all afternoon if you wish. Just at that point, Mrs. Taylor leaned over to Mrs. Williams and said, will you and Dr. Williamson have dinner with me tonight? And history is a wonderful thing. Please follow this. We sat down to dinner. I was called to a long-distance telephone. They told me that President Hibben had just been killed on Highway 1. I never knew why they called me, because I was, he helped bring us here, but that was due to Dr. Erdman. I knew him just a little bit. I came back and mentioned that. Mrs. Taylor said, that settles it. I want to put my house in order, get Charlie Erdman, Get your banker, get your real estate men. I want to give you $350,000 in cash for a new campus before midnight tonight. We did all of that, and you sit on that new campus. And just while I'm passing, may I say that the new men's dormitory has cost more than a whole campus put together. <laughs> so... Uh, Maybe your stomachs are not lined with gold, but where you sit and where you wash and where you study, there's gold all around you as far as we are concerned. Mrs. Taylor was a person who made that all possible. She was here, we are happy to report, when we dedicated the new buildings. And she gave us all her love and affection. Without her, this school would not have had this beautiful permanent abiding place. You'll find her picture on that side of the lounge. Be sure and look at it. Then the next name is Colonel Nelson A. Talbot. When we lost Mrs. Talbot, or General Nelson A. Talbot, a bigger pardon, Bud Talbot came on as president of the board. He was her son. He was a captain in the first war, a colonel in the second war, and a general in the Korean incident. He helped us in a very wonderful way, had great plans for the school, the day after he retired, his heart stopped beating, and we lost him. He was a man we all loved. Whenever he spoke here, Mrs. Williamson always passed on his stories. He was careful about the stories, but he always liked to pretend that he was going to shock her, and she always played the game with him, that she would pass on his stories. But we were always were a little bit on pins and needles as to what the stories might be. But yet he never would, because he was too great a gentleman. The only thing that Princeton holds against him, he was captain of the Yale football team when they dedicated Palmer Stadium, and they beat Princeton that day. <laughs> then comes the next, day, the next name, that of Mr. Arthur Judson, who is now the president of our board of trustees. He came on as president when Mr. Talbot died and is president of the board ever since. He's one of the greatest names in the managerial field in music. Then comes two names that are very close to our heart. First, John Gaius Bumgardner. Came into our college when it opened, was with us from 1926, and he died while he was working. He had just sung that evening in the Messiah, the trumpet shall sound. He went to bed, he didn't awaken. Big fella, six feet three, 190 pounds when he was stripped for football or basketball, baseball, a man who never wavered and never gave in an inch. Then the name, another man, Mr. Harry Krimmel. He also came to us in 1929, left us in 1949. 
He, with Bud Talbot, is responsible for our entire financial setup, and we're very proud of our financial setup. Each year we keep in the black. We have no debts. We have no endowment. We pay our debts as best we can each year, but at the end of the year we are clear. Mr. Krimmel will always be remembered, not only for his kindliness, but his hard work. He had that crazy Westminster way of working all hours and giving him of himself. He came home from a uh, pleasure trip in Mexico. He called the doctor, said, I don't feel well. He described his symptoms. The doctor was playing golf. He said, walk over to the hospital and I'll be there. Ten minutes later, he walked over and he was gone with a heart attack. And then comes two names, one who is still with us. That is Mrs. Lorene Hodap. She is a founding faculty member of Westminster Choir College. She was on the faculty when it opened, and for 31 years she has served on our faculty. Is she here this morning? She fell the other day and hurt herself. Uh, but she will be with us. And the next name comes then also that of Mr. David Hugh Jones. He was with us from the beginning of the school, but on the 25th year, the seminary asked that they be allowed to have him as a full professor, so he served till the end of the 25th year. He is now with Princeton Seminary as a full professor, carrying on their work. Now we have a new name we must add to that, that of Mr. George Crever. He came to us 1938. He's been with us 19 years. He expected to retire this year. He was a wonderful man. His work was always in ahead of time. This spring, all the plans for the courses this year were set up by Mr. Guevara with the help of Mr. David York. And I remember the day, right around commencement, Mr. Guevara came in to see me. Dr. Winston, I can't see. I can't see. I can hardly see you. He tried to teach in summer school, and the eyesight got worse. They took him during the summer to a hospital, had what they thought a major operation. They didn't make the major operation because they found that he couldn't live, and in two days he was gone. He was brought to this country by the NBC Symphony to make arrangements for the symphony. His father was a clergyman, both of his brothers clergymen. He was unhappy in New York professional life, and he came to us. He was a great man and a great leader, and he will be remembered. There are other names that we can mention, but these are special names that must go on the scroll of honor in your own particular place that you keep in your memory such names. Now today I want to talk about Westminster Choir College, an idea that has always been an ideal Thus spoke Dr. Daniel Poling, internationally known leader of Christian youth. Thus he has described the impulse that brought Westminster Choir College into being. Clemenceau, the great French statement, wrote, Ideas bring courage. Huxley, the English novelist, went farther, or an author, rather, and a novelist. Ideas bring courage. Courage brings determination, and determination brings action. Westminster Choir College is a result of ideas, is the result of the courage that was created in the hearts of faculty, students, and trustees. And it was the determination in the minds and hearts of these people that made the reality of what Westminster Choir College is today. Not a dream not an intangible thing, just a few simple ideas. This morning, I speak before you for the 31st and for the last time at the opening of our college. I want to present to you the ideas that brought all this about. First, and most important, children, youth, and adults deserve the right to creative growth through leadership in the public worship of God. That was the first idea that started all of this. Things have not changed, but now the youth of the world deserves that opportunity. And the second, 
the most exalted form of evangelism becomes a reality through the honesty and integrity that beautiful and meaningful singing in the church demands when the singing is used to bring the worshiper into communion with God. Too many young people think about opera and think about concert. Why? The funny little world, word called fame, the funny little word called applause. Those who are great serve. And they know that greatness cannot be without God. They know that art is meaningless without spiritual power. And those are the two ideas that made Westminster Choir College what it is today. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, I want to be a great organist. I want to be. The question is why? And what are you going to do about it? The first was a challenge to the youth of the world because we believe the greatest powers in youth are the creative and recreative powers and because we believe that through music, drama, and the arts, these powers can be most easily developed. In the first year of our baby school, these things were taken up and put in an article in the Christian century. It was translated into 13 languages and 39 dialects. And that's the reason that we have people here from all over the world. And that's the reason that we've had people with us from all over the world, because these ideas were made available to the world. The second was also a challenge to the youth of the world because we believe that when youth can use these creative powers in worship of God, then youth will find the joy that comes through a oneness with God and his son Jesus. And that is still true. In Sendai, we had three young Buddhists, handsome young lads, a little bit puzzled. After our program, they came up to me, Dr. Williamson, a revolution has taken place in our hearts. We are going to be Christians. We don't know why. We just know in the singing of those hymns, something happened to us. Those three men will be on our campus next year. I hope that none of you will say to them, you don't have to worry much about religion because this might mean that they'd be excommunicated by their families. But just in the singing of a hymn, they said, a revolution has come into my heart. So these stills exist. These two ideas have become a reality. And again we say that we believe the task of the choir college is to train leaders for this challenge from the world of these two ideas. Our views as to the training of leadership have not changed through the year. First, we believe that the leader must have a strong body. Second, we believe that the leader must have a, be a good actor. Third, that he must know and love people. Fourth, that he must be a good musician. Five, that he must be a cultured individual with good taste. And six, that he must be a Christian leader. We first believed that a leader for this program must have a strong body. Fortunately for our college, this belief has become such a reality that we received this year a gift of 100,000 to off the plans for a new life science building. These plans are completed. In this building with entire equipment costing about $1,600,000, we hope to develop strong, vital bodies. Just one phase of that is a beautiful swimming pool. But no one may graduate from the choir college until he passes his life-saving test. That is man and woman of the people who lose their lives every year in the United States. Many of them come from that large group of people who know nothing about swimming. Second, because we will have a fully equipped stage and complete equipment for putting on a plays and all dramatic performances, we can continue in a greater way in the belief that we had at the beginning that each individual must become a good actor. Art is a spiritual reality and demands a portrayal of moods and you never learn to really portray mood until you stand all alone on the stage. You must do it with your own voice. Three, from the beginning, we have believed that the leader must know and love people. So courses of study are now developing in such a way 
that it will be impossible for the respective leader to escape this knowledge. Just for a, a small example, one of the final courses in the senior year will be a course in public relations and a course in personal relations. And that will come after psychology and after sociology. That has to do only with the leader. Fourth, in the beginning we felt that each individual must be a good musician with a high level of personal excellence. And they must have had experience in the highest level of performance. So Westminster Choir came into being. Twice we toured Europe. This last time we made a trip around the world. And other tours are being developing now. Since 1938, our young people have had 122 performances with the New York Philharmonic Symphony. There has never in history been such a record. It has never happened that one choir and one orchestra has done such a thing. During that same time, 80 performances were given with other symphonies, singing all of the great conductors. For example, there have been 45 performances under Bruno Walter and 25 under the late Arturo Toscanini. A week ago tomorrow, Mrs. Williams and I spent a couple hours with Dr. Walter. He sent his affectionate greetings to all of the faculty to send his cordial regards to all of you. He is conducting October the 9th of this year the Ninth Symphony with the Chicago Symphony. And if his health is preserved, I assure you some date great times are ahead for all of you with Bruno Water next year. When the school opened, every individual in the school, this was the beginning of Westminster Choir College, every being in school had to study a keyboard instrument, had to play in the orchestra as well as sing in the choir. We are coming back to that again. In time, we're going to refuse to accept all of those who do not play a keyboard instrument well and who have not had experience playing in the orchestra and band. Those two things will be absolutely essentials for entering to choir college. Not so that we can go ahead, but so we can go back to where we were at the beginning. I can tell you something about your present faculty, some about their orchestral performances. We did our best to have great performances in our limited way, but those limits have vastly improved, as you will discover, when you follow the great artists that we have had at our college, when you follow the record of Westminster Choir and our record with the symphony orchestras. I remember with joy that in our last year in Dayton, we had Walter Damros spending a day with us. We had John Charles Thomas giving a recital just for our school. We had Peter Letkin and a host of other great artists. Five, we have believed that a leader must have a broad human and Christian culture and must himself reflect the best of taste. From the beginning, our courses were designed with this thought in view and they are steadily being improved. This fall, we start the first of three semesters faculty examination by the faculty of its own work as artists, scholars, and teachers. In February 59, we have the final examination by a board of examiners from the Middle States Association of Colleges and Secondary Schools so that we may be certain that we of the faculty are on the highest possible level of taste, excellence, scholarship, and culture. That will go on for four semesters on the part of our faculty. And if our faculty are willing to do this, the students, Force must show the same, the same willingness. Six, from the very beginning of the college, we believe that music and the arts are the tools that the leader must use in a program of Christian education and evangelism to bring people into communion with God. I get so much annoyed when I hear people say, well, son, I don't want to study English, I want to be a singer. Why do I have to study theory? I want to be a singer. Why do I have to study Christian education? I want to be a singer or a pianist or a church musician. In the beginning when the school started, I was director of Christian education and minister of music in the church of, I think, 2,600 members. And I, had, I held those offices right through because you cannot separate Christian education and music. Every junior choir, every chair of choir, every boy choir, every high school choir is a part of a program of Christian education. And that has, time has come when we must stop this foolishness of saying we want to be musicians. Not separate Christian education and music. 
Every junior choir, every chair of choir, every boy choir, every high school choir is a part of a program of Christian education. And that has, time has come when we must stop this foolishness of saying we want to be musicians. We have to be greater than musicians. We have to be educators. We also believe that the future leader must have great experience in worship. We opened our college in a beautiful church built by Cram, the noted Boston architect. When we came to Princeton through Dr. Erdman's help and President Hibbins' help at the university, we were privileged to have regular services every Sunday afternoon in Princeton Chapel. We're now working to bring about a beautiful chapel on our own campus where the students may have active experience in worship and active experiences in using the art of communications. This college, and please listen, this college was not designed to further opera, concert work, or any type of popular entertainment. It was designed only for the two reasons expressed in the first two ideas. We have no objection to opera or to concert work. Some of our graduates have success in both of these, but their success has not been due because they prepared to sing an opera in concert. Their success has been due because they prepared to serve God in the most beautiful and exalted way. And because of that, their art and their spiritual being, these opportunities have come to them. The world now challenges us. If you look at Mrs. Taylor's picture, you'll see her hand is in the globe, and the other hand, a finger is in the Bible. And that finger in the Bible is to this passage, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. That was her dream for this college. That was Mrs. Talbot's dream for this college. Rhea and I prepared to be missionaries in a music way, and they laughed at us. Now they want us to start doing that missionary work that we should have done when we were young. But I'm sure our ideas were wrong or we wouldn't have had this college. But we must face that our work now is in the entire world. We were on a train to Japan, a nine hour trip to Sendai. It was hot and unpleasant. Suddenly I saw two little blondes sitting across a boy and a girl. We proceeded to fall in love with each other. We got it with a quaint with the parents, but Westminster Choir, oh, I'm the University of Wisconsin. I remember you used to come out there. I said, yes, I was there five years. And then the grandmother spoke up. I'm the wife of a Methodist preacher, and I'm a Methodist preacher. Oh, we've been helped by Westminster Choir. We met many people in Japan that we never knew, that knew us, and knew people here, and knew our faculty. We were on the plane coming to Los Angeles out of Honolulu. Just after we got up from the ground, a lady came to us and said, How do you do, Mr. and Mrs. Westminster? And we said, Well, who are you? said, I've been a missionary for 25 years in Malaya. We love your Dr. Peterson. We love your Bill Zimmerman and his wife. We've loved every person you've sent out to us. This morning, there's a boy here from, from the school in Singapore, Malaya. And his life was touched by this woman, this woman. There are many young people here this morning from different parts of the world. And this college ceases to exist for you. It exists to serve the world. Never before has the world so needed religion and so needed music and the arts when they were consecrated by, delicate, by dedicated individuals to the cause of making the world better. I want to read a poem that appeared in all the newspapers of the world in 1950. I copied it from the New York Times. Spring has come. It has come here. It has come in China, in the new streets of Warsaw, in Prague, in the gardens of Bucharest, in the villages of Bulgaria. The banner of victory flies over us. The spring of humanity is with us. It is nearing the workers' suburbs of Paris. It is marching like a master's upon the piazzas of Rome. In Calcutta, Karachi, and Bombay, it sings of freedom. Our Stalin, whose hand guides the spring of humanity, is leading us to victory.
Did you hear that? That still goes on. I don't know how this ever happened. I have a picture here. You can't see clearly. There are 22 men and 22 women. They're all robed in velvet with beautiful colors. And it says under this, worldly choristers called to the Ulaanbaatar Theater for youth rally arranged by the Young Communist League. This is a choir from Outer Mongolia. Then they show all the Buddhists. I don't know what you call them, gods, but they're in gold and brass and silver, that they've been relegated to museums. Now only the communists appear. On the other side, there's a picture. It says, Songfest brings soldiers and girls together to chant party and unison tunes from skulls, scrolls on the trees. Song praises happiness, freedom, and the red government. They have their choirs every place. I was told by one of the most distinguished men in church life and in missionary life Saturday night that in 20 years, unless something was done soon, the entire Orient and the entire Asia would be communist that nothing was being done to stop them. That maybe if the choir college might help to have better choirs than they had, we might stop it because they were doing it through choirs. It's a terrifying thought. We have just been in Japan where there are 4,800 choirs led by communist leaders. They are dressed in the most beautiful kimonos. The outstanding ones are all sent to Moscow free with all expenses paid. So when they come back, they lead and make their choirs better. Their song book is a book of only one thing. That is freedom, happiness, and the red government. And you know what happiness means to a slave, and you know what freedom means when you are a slave. We find, however, that there's a growing movement among these choirs that says this can't be right. Give us something better. We had over a thousand leaders in our choir. Some of them were communists, and they talked. We held one of our school in a Buddhist university. Mrs. Williamson and I lived in a Buddhist, Buddhist hotel that was part of a Buddhist temple. Our waiters, the bellboys, were Buddhist priests. We've never had such a wonderful time and such beautiful attention in our life. Why are there? Because they're scared of communists. The first day a priest stood up and said, we have invited you Christians here because perhaps if we get together we can bring about peace. And what they meant, stop communism. When they say this can't be right, they mean singing only songs of that one way. Can't you give us different music? That was the task that Dr. Rhea and I had in Japan. We went there not as anti-communists. We went there as pro-cultured Christian leaders. We were not allowed to mention the American government, the American people. We could mention the choir college because they felt we were all right. We were supposed to be Japanese in our entire inclination and willing to work in a pro-Christian way to bring a higher level of culture into choral music. And they think that maybe that may save the Orient. Does that affect you? You don't know it, but it does. Because the only hope that can bring this about are the people like you. And that is the task that the choir college has in the world today. It isn't just the church. It's whether the church will be destroyed or whether it will live. I pray that you, faculty, students, and alumni of this college will hold to the ideas upon this, which this college was built. In the past, many people have wished to change the college because it has not changed but held loyal to the ideas of the beginning. The college is gradually becoming known as an institution for its fundamental belief and faith in these ideas that have now become ideals. After this year, Dr. Rhea and I will be with you 
not as president and dean, but as friends and helpers. We may not always be in Princeton because our task will be in many places, but our council will be here, our prayers will be here, and our hearts will be here. I pray that God will bless us through this year, a year of reaffirming of the ideals and rediscovery of the ideas of Westminster Choir College and a year of developing new and greater leadership for the future. program we gave in Japan closed with a benediction sung in Japanese and the Buddhist priest sang with us. These memories come flooding back. We were going to the station in Osaka, finished our program at Koyasan where we were in the Buddhist temple and with Buddhists. The railroad station we suddenly heard singing and there were the three young Buddhist fellows and they have with them three young communists, great big giants of men, very handsome because they always pick the best looking. They shook hands with him one day and I knew exactly what they meant and they never said a word because he almost crushed my hand. We heard this singing and there they were singing and waiting for bags. Things like that go deeper than anything that happens in life. This benediction is something that's very close now this morning we have certainly new faculty members that we want to present. Uh, Miss Glasser is not here. She is a, wo is a woman who has been thoroughly trained for 31 years. She has taught physical ed education and health. She will help in the physical education program, but will be in charge of the two divisions of biology. We have this morning with us Mr. Arlo Duba, a graduate student who's a fellowship teacher at Princeton Seminary working for his doctorate in Christian education and he will help us in Christian education. Mr. Dubo, will you stand please? Thank you. We have with us this morning Mr. James Waters, a graduate of our college, has his master's from a college, went two years in Europe in the fellowship to study then he had went to the college called Uncle Sam's College. Been there two years, and we're so proud to have him back with us. We know you, but will you still play a stand, James? 
because of the loss of Mr. Rivera, and we shall miss him, we are very happy that his right-hand assistant was David Stanley York. On each program we sang once to every man and nation. We have recorded it so that Mr. York could hear it. Uh, we have also recorded the benediction so you would all hear it. And we're happy to announce that Mr. David Stanley York is now the head of the theory department, Mr. York. I think for that you should applaud. We have a gentleman with us who will be in charge of public relations and promotion at Westminster Choir College. Uh, personally, I'm very happy to have him here for a very peculiar reason. He came to us, I think it was uh, 1922, I'm not quite sure of that date, but the beginning, uh, 1923. When was it, John? 1924. We started the, the choir, he was a member of the choir, and some of the young, the young people felt that they had certain rights and privileges. I never will forget the day he stood up in rehearsal and said, Dr. Williamson, may I speak? It wasn't doctor then, it was just plain mister. May I speak? He said, I said, yes, he stood up. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I mortgaged my farm to be here. Some of you are trying to destroy my investment. You are drinking. If I find any one of you drinking, I shall thrash you, and after I thrashed you, I will take you to Dr. Williamson and see that you are put out, because I cannot lose my farm because of your willingness to drink. So we came to have such a person, a man here, I thought, I want John Clough here, and lo and behold, John Clough is here. He's now Dr. John Clough. He's just as unpleasant as he used to be. <laughs> But yet he's such a good psychologist that all during the World War, every foreman in all the factories of Syracuse had to take courses with him on how to handle people. So he knows how to handle people without thrashing them. And we're very proud to have, after 28 years in the church that he went into, right after he graduated, we're very proud to have with us Dr. John Clough and his wife Gertrude. Dr. Will you stand up, Gertrude, please? She is very busy because she wanted me to make this announcement. Her daughter, Carolyn, is getting married tomorrow night at 7.30 in the First Presbyterian Church. And she wishes to invite all of you, her friends of Carolyn, or her friends, or friends of Nancy, if you'd like to come to the wedding at 7.30 tomorrow night in the First Presbyterian Church. <laughs> 